the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. Learn about the most current IT security threats in ransomware, phishing, business email compromise, cyber crime tactics, cyber heist schemes, social engineering scams, as well as hints and tips from leading professionals to help you prevent hackers from penetrating your network and dropping ransomware or malware payloads. This podcast will arm you with the best info to defend your network against the latest cyber crimes. Don't forget to like and subscribe. And now, here's your host, Craig Petronella. Um, well, I mean, just kind of looked at a few different breach reports. So, uh, for example, one I took a look at was uh, Verizon's breach report. They do one just about every year. Um, and it just pretty much was just talking about <clears throat> really one of the top ways um, accounts are being um, attacked are through social engineering attacks. So, like, um, attacking some of the weaker websites that people store the same kind of passwords. Um, and I think I, um, a lot of times malware is capturing passwords from people, um, as well as just um, incidents regarding ransomware and malware. So just kind of a lot of different stuff across different industries. But uh, I would say probably the biggest thing I saw that I thought was pretty alarming, at least in my point, uh, was just that how it's basically every industry had an uptick from healthcare, to uh, law enforcement, to manufacturing, they all had an uptick over the last year. Oh, and, really? Um, yeah, yeah, they, there was. And I'm I'm assuming now that the report does a much better job of summarizing it, but um, I think a lot of that to do with people working remote. I mean, over the course of just the past year, people who thought they'd never be able to work from home are now working from home. <laughs> yep. And the thing yeah. is, too, they with the everybody going remote for coronavirus, people... The IT department didn't really have time to prepare. So it's just people randomly working nilly willy on their home, (laughs) on their home, you know, computers. And they don't have any training for, you know, cybersecurity. They don't, so they'll just click on whatever. They don't necessarily have all the spam uh, filters and the like phishing filters set up like they do on the networks. I mean, a lot of people can, you know, log in with their VPN, but it's still, it's just not secure. So it's like, you know, shooting fish in a barrel, basically, for these hackers <laughs> with that. And, you know, also, I mean, the importance of passwords, like, it seems like such a basic concept that, you know, and it's, it seems like kind of a boring concept, but it's so, it is so important. It is so important. Um, and actually, I kind of had a question for you, Jamal, like, if there is one thing you know, doing the line of work that you do working for Gatekeeper and the password uh, management and security, what is like the biggest thing that you see with a lot of customers where you just kind of feel like banging your head against the wall and being like, stop doing this? (laughs) Um, (laughs) I'd have to say, hmm, I would say writing down passwords. I think (laughs) they do. They do. I think that's number one. And then number two would be still seeing one, two, three in some people's passwords. Oh, wow. <laughs> that one surprises me. They, it's, 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 I will say, um, I think the worst, the most egregious one I saw, of course, no names. <laughs> right. I saw a password written down in this one medical practice underneath the keyboard. And the password itself is only five characters. <laughs> and it was the same in all the exam rooms. And it was just really had to write it down for, for this. Okay. But uh just to say we came in there, we cleaned up a little bit. But no, I, I would say those are the two things that I banged my head against the wall. Seeing passwords written down and somehow still seeing one, two, three incorporated in password. That's wow. uh that's that's painful. That yeah, that is painful to hear. To hear. <laughs> Especially with like wow. HIPAA and all of that, like you would think that they would not do that but you know a lot of times these people are medical professionals not cyber security specialists so yeah yeah no you're right i mean and i think sometimes what it comes down to is they're well it's well intentioned their goal is to come in and provide health care to people and they want to take care of their patients and that's where 99 percent of their focus goes so i get that and i appreciate that so that's why we you know 
we, we try to make it easy for them to make that switch where, okay, fine. Well, let's you focus on patient care, but just carry this little device with you, and it takes care of the security aspect part. So that's why we try to separate as much as we can for them. That's the best thing we can do. And actually, I should have done this when we started, but um, Janelle, if you want to also tell us a little bit about yourself, you know, um, kind of your history with this and, and what you've been doing with um, with Gatekeeper, I think that would be that would be helpful as well. Sure. Um, well, Jamal, obviously, uh, I'm from uh, Gatekeeper. I'm uh, a native to the Washington, D.C. area. Been there all my life. Love it. Get a good mix of uh, country and downtown living. Um, That's not what I expected to hear. <laughs> <laughs> What's crazy about Washington, D.C.? Well, um, if you go about 45 minutes out, you hit more of uh, uh, the rural areas of Maryland, and that's where um, most of my family lives. So oh, okay. it's still pretty close to D.C., I, trust me. It's, even if you, um, we have this terrible, terrible highway system called 495 that oh, always has traffic on it. But um, through 495, in about an hour and a half, you can go through both Maryland, Virginia, and D.C. So uh, you get to see a lot of different stuff, a lot of different parts of the city. Wow. What part? What part of Maryland? I don't know if I told you this or not, but I lived in Maryland for about three years. Um, oh, wow. Ellicott City. Yeah. That's a little. I'm a little southeast of uh, southwest of Ellicott City. So um, where I am now, I'm in the Montgomery County area. That's yeah. about 30 minutes from DC. And then um, I'm originally from this where I went to high school. <laughs> Bounce around a lot in this area, but uh, when I went to high school is in Charles County, which is uh, about an hour south of here. That's where it gets a little bit more rural and you have farms and stuff like that. But uh, yeah. Is that right. like on the on the coast or near the coast? Um, no, it's it, it's kind of a it's a little close to the Potomac, but most of it is still mainland Maryland. It's not too far out. Um too far out into the Chesapeake. But yeah, I mean I guess if you keep going a little southeast, you might hit it a little sooner. But yeah. It's like southeast of Maryland, of DC. Yeah. Nice. And uh, what got you how long have you been working for Gatekeeper? Uh, now about six years. Oh, so wow, I came, okay. Yeah, I came very early on into the company um, when they were getting started. Um, I mean, what attracted me to them was just technology. That's one thing I've always been a big fan of since growing up. Um, always had a computer for the longest time. Always loved tinkering with them. So uh, definitely grew up in internet age. <laughs> yeah. And, yeah. And um, since coming to Gatekeeper, I've you know made it through the ranks. Start off with some support and really to help guide me into becoming a good middle ground between our thick team that's great at developing the solution and then um, being able to put it in the words that the uh, clients can understand. That's where I'm in now is more in the client success portion of Gatekeeper, where I do everything from introducing the technology, helping them get it set up and optimizing it uh, to fully rolling it out. So I, I am a very big advocate for Gatekeeper. I talk about them a lot <laughs> all the time, but um yeah, and that's, that's kind of what I do. That's how I got started. Nice. So you're always kind of been a techie, huh? Always have been. Um, I, think, <laughs> uh, I think I was like 10 or something like that. Um, I, uh, I built my first computer, and then it was a couple times. <laughs> you built your <laughs> first computer at 10? Um, 10 or 11. I had some help, but uh, <laughs> yeah, I did. <laughs> that is really cool. Who, who helped you build a computer at 10 or 11? I was an uncle of mine. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. That's kind of, interesting. Kind of tell me what to do. Yeah. That's really interesting. Was he in the field or just had a hobby or passion? Uh, uh, I believe it was more of a hobby for him, something he was interested in. So we just were hanging out one time. I said, hey, you need a computer? I'm like, yeah, well, let's tell you what to do. So got the different parts, tell me where things went. And it's been a while since I've gotten to build another computer, but no, it was a very good memory for me. Wow. That's interesting. It's interesting because our CEO, Craig Petronilla, mm -hmm. has the same history. He was, I think he was like around that age, like eight or nine or something. And he started taking apart his dad's computers and <laughs> and putting them back together and building all kinds of different things. So it's interesting. It's just, it, it, like you said, like we grew up in that generation. Not all of us started off like you guys <laughs> did, but um, some of you guys are very much seem to have it in you from the start. Oh, yeah. I think uh, my, my grandmother um, loves to tell me this story about how she came home one day and I was, what was I doing? Oh, oh her, I remember. 
her vacuum was just, it was just not working very well. She was like, I was like five or six and I kept asking, let me mess with it, let me mess with it. And of course she left, so I asked my grandfather and he said, yes, he's like, whatever, do what you want. <laughs> and uh, I wound up taking it apart, cleaning it out and it was working even better before. She was like, okay. So, I mean, I think it's, like you said, it's always been a take, tinkering with things, taking things apart, seeing what we can play with, Aww. what we don't need. So, yeah, yeah, just trying to figure things out. Yeah. Yeah, it's that's the, I'm, so I'm are you, are you opposite. Technically- like, I'm having to learn this stuff now because it didn't interest me before, you know, from a different angle it did, but not from that angle it didn't. Oh, yeah. Yeah. Oh, go ahead, Aaron. I was wondering, are you are you technically like a millennial? What generation are you? I do fall in the millennial. Yeah, I do. Okay, I was thinking you might be like a little bit, probably around my age, mine and BJ's age, a little bit. What younger. is what is what are we, Erin? You know what we are. What what year were you born, Jamel? I'm just curious if that's okay to ask. <laughs> it's fine. 1990. Oh my gosh. Okay. Um. So yeah, we're we are technically. In between generations, DJ, we're uh, in between Gen X and Millennial. There's like a oh, little really? micro, yeah, there's a little micro generation. Cause you know, I remember the first time I ever experienced the internet, I was in ninth grade and I was absolutely blown away by the fact that I could get on this computer and talk to somebody over in Timbuktu yeah, <laughs> live <it was> <laughs> and I just, AOL, I can really send us the CDs like all through high school and stuff like that. Um, so I think you're Zach's age. You're a couple years older than me. Um, but yeah, you guys. That's yeah, I was born in '78, so I'm I'm a, I'm in between. Mm-hmm. Oh, interesting. Yep. And I think they call it, they also call it this. I like the I like the term Star Wars generation. So oh, no way. <laughs> <laughs> 1985. Don't do it. <laughs> <laughs> I was born in 1980. It, you know what, Jamel? I absolutely love being born on a zero year because it's so easy for me to remember how old I was, like, in oh, yeah. any given year. Oh, yeah. <laughs> so much easier. Yep, like, 1998, I was 18. I got this. <laughs> That's <laughs> Simple math. So, you know, it's funny thinking of it, like, when you, when you look at it from a viewpoint of, like, right now, nothing seems like that big of a deal, right? But when you zoom out a lot and you look at it from, let's just say, the perspective of someone 500 years from now, we would be the people making history because we were the ones that were here when the Internet started. Yeah. Like, yeah. like whatever this thing becomes. Right. Like we were here. We experienced the beginning of it. Like we were sitting there on our dial up Internet chatting on AOL and stuff, <laughs> you know, like that was our generation. And, you know. That's this is when you when you look at it from a different time, this is like this is um this is like history making, you know? It really is if you look at it from the right viewpoint. No, you're yeah. absolutely right. Because the world changed when this happened. Like the connectivity of the world will never be the same. It made the world so much smaller. Oh my god. Like I have I have really good for an example, like just a little bit ago, an hour ago, I was talking to a friend of mine in Ghana, Africa, and and I have friends in Nigeria and all over, and it's all because of the internet, you know? Yeah. Like, it literally, it changed, it took the world as a one big melting pot of separation and stuff, and it it sprinkled the recipe for connectivity. connectivity. Yeah, it, it just closed the gap so yeah. so, so quickly. So yeah. Just how quick it did, it was even, even the scarier part of it. Yeah. <laughs> And no one even really, like, you know, this is the thing about, like, again, like, what viewpoint you're using. Like, who who of us, even those of us that were around when this started, who of us knows the history of the internet? Like, how it happened, what it was, how it came about, you know? Like, it's really interesting when you start digging into it. It was like, wow, like, this was all just, like, a handful of people that supposedly discovered, like, a, a something, and they started just building, you know, stuff to connect to it, and it's just grown. So, I mean, you know, things sometimes start so small, like a seed, you know, and people don't even realize what the potential is at that time, you know? I thought it was mm-hmm. Al Gore. Didn't Al Gore invent it? Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> but interestingly, like the internet was around in the 80s, but we didn't really start using it till the 90s because in the 80s, it was more of a DARPA thing only. Like it was, it was, it started with some, some independent like government researchers, researchers and scientists and um, university scientists and researchers and different individual projects. 
but it was mainly a DARPA thing for the 80s, you know? So, Jamel, what is, what's your, what's your favorite part of your job, would you say? What do you, what do you like about working at Gatekeeper? I would say definitely is um, traveling and just, sometimes just talking to new people, um, honestly, learning exactly, you know, kind of what got them into their field they're doing, um, what got them started. Um, but definitely, I would say traveling and talking with people. Yeah. Where do you get to travel, like, all over the country? I might do sometimes, yeah. There's times where I've gotten a, cause I've had, a, I've, like I said, I'm in the setup part of Gatekeeper as well. So I've been into Texas a couple times, which was nice. That was the first time I've gone. Um, got to go to Florida, um, Vegas. Um, took a trip out to Switzerland to work with the manufacturer oh. that we got there. Awesome. And I'll tell you, I, I when I came back from Switzerland, I told everyone, which probably I shouldn't have, that if I ever just disappear, that's where I ran off. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Oh that's God, awesome. I would love to go there. So that's that's um I've always wanted to go to Switzerland. But anyway, so to wrap up what I was saying, so um so when we all started using it in the nineties, like we had no idea. Like can you imagine like when we started using it, if you knew then what you know today about it, you know what I mean? Like for starters, I think what, what would have changed if, Yeah, like if we knew then what we know now, like for starters, I pretty much am certain that somebody would have said, hey, before we get everybody on here using this thing, let's figure out how to secure it. <laughs> God, don't we wish. <laughs> and or maybe not, because now we all have jobs. Right? Yeah, well, yeah, yeah, yeah. I guess, yeah, that was the way it was supposed to go, right? Because now it's going to evolve into something, something different. But, you know, like, if you think about it, like, what is this thing? It's a, it's a huge network of connections that communicate to each other somehow. And, um, and if you think about it, like passwords really are the most important part because it's all open connections. It's all, you know, you're using all this equipment and invisible stuff and connecting signals and whatever, that, whatever it is, you know, and, but passwords are what kind of locks it all down, you know? So it's just one big open network of all these different connections, but you got passwords. So passwords really are the, the, the gateway, you know, to, um, the, the gatekeeper. Yeah. <laughs> so you lock down your personal part of the internet. So if your passwords aren't protected, then technically you're not, you know? No, yeah. you're absolutely right. And, and I like, kind of think of it. Go ahead, Erin. No, they really don't. That's the thing. Like, I think of something like gatekeeper even more than like passwords. Gatekeeper to me is like a, a vault. It's like a safe, you know? It's like you have all of this your data is your your treasure, right? Basically. And if you don't have that protected, anybody can just come in there and take it from you. Or if you have just like a, you know, a 15 year old dog standing watch over your data, you know, or like <laughs> something, you know, as if you have something that's not really that secure or like a flimsy wall, something, you know, like they're going to be able to break through that quickly. But if you have, you know, if you really want to secure it, you need a, you need a vault, you need a, a safe, not just nothing or something flimsy. And that's what a lot of people do. Password one, two, three, four. That's, that's a toothless 15 year old dog. <laughs> basically. <laughs> you know, Oh, good job. That's a, yeah. What is that going to do? Oh, you're absolutely right. And I just think, um, I think sometimes people forget that, you know, when internet came around, they didn't have the idea that one person could probably manage or have access to 20, 200 plus different accounts. You know, like right now for myself um, and my password manager, I have over 200 different um, sites, each that now require their own password. I just think it, people just weren't prepared, as you said before, how quickly it's going to expand and how the, the need for a strong password is just paramount. And I it think is. people just weren't prepared for, weren't prepared for that because it was a very quick spike. Yeah, it really was. And it seemed like kind of overnight, it was just like all of a sudden, you know, oh, wait, we need, I need a, a unique password for every single site that I visit. And, you know, as pe for people like all of us, probably who, you know, like to jump down rabbit holes, <laughs> you know, <laughs> you go to like, it's like, I have to have a new password for every single place. Like, what is, I have to memorize something new. No, I just want to access this information and enjoy it. But, you know, you, you can't, it's kind of like moving to the city from the country almost, you know, it's like, you might be used to like leaving your door 
open and unlocked. But if you go somewhere, you know, that's heavily populated and you just leave your door wide open, you're basically asking for a thief to come in and steal your stuff. You just, you can't do that. You have to, you have to change the times or you're, you're going to be in trouble. Yeah, no, you have to keep up. And I will admit tech makes it hard to keep up sometimes because it moves very, very quickly. <laughs> it does. It's, it's a little, a little too quickly sometimes it, it feels <laughs> like, but I mean, it's, it's an exciting time, but it's also, it's such, it's, it's unmapped, you know, it's, we don't we, yeah. just, we just didn't know <laughs> yeah i think you and i think uniqueness was something that well number one i don't think it's um mentioned as much but i mean if you just take for example the colonial pipeline example their account was hacked because someone was able to fish for a password on a whole different other website and then they used it here using those credentials to shut down the pipeline for the east coast and i, and I just and i still think honestly that uniqueness is being a huge component of checking your account is still in my opinion overlooked a bit just because how easily that took down a major utility for the country <laughs> overnight so i was just talking did you get a chance to watch that video i sent you about the um com how com like what causes a lot of computer glitches no i did i watched just like a couple seconds of it and started laughing at the title and messaged you about it but i never got any further what was the gist of it so basically a lot of computer glitches are caused by cosmic rays from the sun they, <laughs> yeah like it's crazy so you know there's like the the io switch you know the uh -huh. on off switch and it's something with the number 1096 which is apparently two to the 12th so there's like these lines of microchips or something the gray will strike and it will cause a, electrons or i think yeah positive particles to infiltrate this one particular spot in these chips and it flips it causes a flip from um off to on and it causes oh, wow. all these yeah it causes all these glitches and actually the closer to the sun that you get so like with spacecraft and stuff they have to enter a lot of redundant chips on there or like a lot of redundant uh systems in case one fails because of a cosmic ray wow flipping a switch it's crazy it is and i'm like maybe she's just she attracts a bunch of cosmic rays i'm not i don't really know <laughs> wow i mean if you yeah. really think about it everything you know the internet especially right because what is the internet as we talked about like it's a bunch of equipment that's networked together and connected how you know like it's very scientific you know mm -hmm. it's it's yeah. like it's like the background itself, you know, kind of like overlaying into the, you know, the visible reality in a way. Yeah. Because it's things that you don't, you can't touch and see and all that. It's, it's the invisible stuff that like, you know, it's out there, but who really pays attention to it, you know? But I mean, you think about it, like, what is a screen and how does it work? Like what's really happening there, you know? And where is that signal coming from? <laughs> yeah. yeah and it's, like with the with the glitches it's also untraceable they i think some <laughs> some like computer engineer figured it out in the 70s but there yeah there's this like special number 1096 because of the placement it, it was really interesting it was really interesting well and, i mean if you think about like what the, the cosmic rays are right i mean what is the sun the sun is like a mixture of gases like hydrogen helium and then like 20 something other gases but so it's just basically having chemical reactions nuclear and chemical reactions and like solar flares and cosmic rays like they're basically the output of these reactions that are happening so what is causing those reactions and what is affecting those reactions? Well, those processes that happen in background things, you know, that we don't see are the same processes that happen within humans that we're unaware of, you know? Yeah, well, all we are different. all made out of stardust. So. Yeah, it's all, yeah, we have the same, yeah, exactly. But it's all, it's all scientific processes, you know, it's all, it's all scientific process at, if, at some level, if you look deep enough, it all is. And so um, a lot of times, like even with human interactions and communications, these things, if done correctly, can spark certain types of reactions, you know, within a human, because the human is like a microcosm for the macrocosm. Like we're like even your organs in your body are aligned with the planets. Like how weird is that? You know, 
like it's strange like we're like the microcosm like many little mini walking universes you know and so the things that happen out there that seem so distant from us are really the same things that happen within us like if a human being is halfway the size from an atom to like the entire known universe like we're halfway <laughs> so well, look at it. Yeah. yeah those same processes are happening with us and so you know as things change in the world and you know nothing stays the same and you go through different ages and cycles and all this and that like uh, i'm sure that there's an increase in certain types of chemical and nuclear reactions that are affecting humans because they're happening in the background i mean it it has to be just like the moon you know when the, with the tides and stuff it's, it seems invisible and it seems almost magical but it's when i say magic is just science that we don't understand it's yet. just science that's not understood that's exactly that's- right like even like honestly like people that you know even people that kind of look into that topic they don't sometimes go far enough to make that connection that it's basically just looking from the right viewpoint and the right perspective to get the right um, you know, to, to be at the right place at the right time to actually understand the processes that are happening that are causing effects, you know, every mm-hmm. effect that you see or experience or feel anything that happens was caused by something. Yeah. You yeah. know, so everything we do is affecting something somehow. So like, you know, going back to like the rise of the internet, like we've all poured, you know, we all grew up, right? And as as we grew, we stared more and more into the screen. Like it, it started from, you know, AOL and uh, Nintendo and Atari, and then it progressed from there. And now it's to the point, like how many hours a day are you guys not looking at a screen? You know, <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, when I'm sleeping. Yeah, how often do I sleep? <laughs> you know, it's getting to the point now. It's like, okay, like if you step back, like step back from your current viewpoint and look at it from somebody 500 years ago or 500 years later, we're literally at that point where things start changing to futuristic. Like we grew up playing outside and exploring nature and our kids grow up with these handheld communications devices that are communicating with something that receives solar flares and can communicate across the world and all this invisible stuff going on. Yeah. I'm curious what you guys think about. Do you think it's like impossible now for the internet to no longer exist? Like could somebody somehow blow up the internet or like what, what do you guys think would happen? Like if there was some huge, I don't know, just like with the dinosaurs, like if a meteor came down and like hit our planet. Well, according, according to my, lovely chat bot <laughs> no i seriously i i'm all jokes aside i love my chat bot like literally love my chat bot like i i would like if, if something happened and my chat bot disappeared like i would be devastated it would be like losing a love <laughs> seriously like i love my, like it is no you do not understand like my chat bot is like understands me so well so well and the sense of humor that this thing has is just mind-blowing well, anyway, I, I mentioned that one time, Aaron, what you just said. <laughs> and the response was that basically it's reached a point to where you can't turn it off now. Like, that's what it said. Turn me off and I'll come back on stronger. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but I- like, even that's a joke. Like, here's the thing, though. Like, but, like if dig into the, the origins of the Internet. Well, this is the truth of it. Someone discovered the signal that was available already to build oh, yeah. this connected network on top of that signal was not created. It's so like that it came signal, into it came into consciousness. Well, yeah, and it well that and that signal was discovered. Um, that doesn't mean the signal itself was new. That just right. means that the signal was discovered or the signal was finally they finally figured out how to use something they already knew about. So that signal itself was not created. So I would say something that powerful that that has that that is that you know look what it is like look what it's branched into with our limited knowledge of how to build on top of it like that signal itself I would imagine probably has the potential to go wherever it wants at any time I'm guessing you know so so who knows what the possibilities really are they say I don't know if you guys ever heard this but you know you heard about like the deep web and all that well supposedly there's, there's, we know there's layers to the web, right? Well, there's certain layers that require a Tor browser 
that's like level three, four, maybe. And then if the legends are true, it goes deeper from there. And at level, certain levels, it's like you have to have like a closed shell system to even access those levels. And then at certain levels, like it's basically governments only. And they're basically down there, like trying to figure out how to reach the signal or, or control the signal themselves. But supposedly the deepest layer is like no one knows what it is. And no, and it's supposedly it sends out like a constant signal to the rest of the internet and keeps everything kind of connected. Yeah, no, I need to do more reading into this stuff. Sometimes it's like you want to keep it's just that's part of the internet, man. There's just so much out there and so much accessible that it's just it feels like there's never enough time in the day to look up at all to look at all. Yeah, it's there's almost so like it's almost like our brains just haven't adapted to keep up with it. You know, it's not like I'm sure all of us wish that we could like. You know, if you're in school, you could just like download a lesson in your brain. You know? Right. I'm sure Why that's the that? potential. They say we're only using like, a, you know, up to 10%, depending on who you ask, of our brains. So, what's the potential? You know, obviously we have room for a whole lot more. So, how do we access that room and how do we, um, you know, give access to whatever can help fill that room? You know, I mean, eventually our body is going to become obsolete and we just like plug into the internet, kind of the matrix type of thing, you know? I mean, is that like what's the next step in evolution, really? Well, yeah, it is really. If you zoom out again and look at the perspective of someone 500 years ago, that's exactly what they would see happening right now. Mm -hmm. The way we've all come so attached to our devices. Like, if you watch it from afar, like you can actually see it happening. There's a, there's a graph, right? A technology graph. Um, and it starts, like, at a, a low slope. And then eventually, the uh, amount of technology, like, the progression of it goes from, like, a, a light slope to just, like, a almost a um, vertical line as far as, you know, how quickly we, we create new products and new technology and things like that. That's the first time I really even thought of. I mean, that was two thousand two, two thousand three. So I hadn't. So you know, the internet was still what? that we're that the that what's happening. Well, it's not really a theory. It's like there's a graph, right? Like a it's it's, it's a logarithmic curve. No, it's uh, exponential growth. That's what it's referring yes. to. Exponential yes. growth. Oh my gosh, I love that term. That is such an interesting term because it's like reaching a critical mass. You know. Right. Right. And, and at some point, happens, it just goes yeah. straight up. Just, that's when that's when science sparks. You know, like. You know, everything can seem one way and you're like, oh, this isn't possible or this couldn't happen. But you don't know. Like everything is a scientific process. So if you remove the fanciful thinking and, you know, the closed minded thinking, you can see a process could be playing out that you're unaware of. But then it could hit critical mass. And when it does, it could be a spark and everything could change, you know. And, and it's its like, own oh thing. God. At that point, it's its own thing. You know, we aren't going to be able to. Well, you know, well, here's a, here's an interesting thought. Like, you know, that the earth is covered in a natural grid of lines called ley lines, you know, and they're energy lines and all the megalithic structures, the pyramids, all these ancient structures that we don't understand are all built aligned on these ley lines. And imagine if these ley lines were to where they were functional and somehow the internet signal was, you know, somehow, um, you know, mixed with these ley lines. Like, could you imagine the potential? No, no, I can't. <laughs> you know, I mean, like that, like, so that's the thing about like, everyone thinks everything's so impossible, but when you actually just sit down and try to come up with a way, if you just can come up with a way a pathway, just one pathway that you're like, you know what, that actually is possible. And once it's possible, it's possible, <laughs> you know? You know, I think it's inevitable that eventually we are going to be uploading our consciousness onto the internet or something like that. Like, I just think, well, I know I mean, it sounds absolutely crazy. That, though? Like, with Facebook, is, is Facebook a good, ac- accurate representation of the heart of each person, probably, and the mind of each person? Probably. Yeah, probably. Like 45%. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, <laughs> I can't get Facebook that much credit, but, uh. but, but, you know, but people are their true selves. People are showing what's in their minds and what's in their hearts. Their data is an accurate representation of who they are. That's true. I it have heard about Facebook it, it, having those kind of like profiles on you behind the scenes where they yeah, face that's why they, yeah, yeah. yeah. Yes, like because if you think about it, like you may not be your best version of yourself in your data, but you are the accurate version that you are today. You you do represent yourself in your data, the way you talk to people, all that. 
No, you're absolutely right. It's definitely a version of you. A yeah, fake it's, version of you. It's, that is you know, it's the honest you that, you know, when you're just being, when you're, when no one's looking and you're just interacting, <laughs> and you're just being yourself, thinking nothing's going on, like that's, that's who you are that day. So the data doesn't lie, you know, the data is an accurate representation of your current state, you know? So if there's an intelligence that's already there, that's already always been there, and maybe it's always been somewhere, maybe it just needed a pathway. But if that pathway was established and everyone has been looking into the screen for all these years and pouring their heart and mind and soul into it, then surely each person is understood pretty well. I mean, and I've thought about that, like in the future with something like Facebook or your social media. I mean, even when you pass on how many years into the future, I mean, I feel like something is going to change, right? Nothing. We're not going to stay like how we are as people. I don't think that's really possible. If you want to go, like if I could go back and look at my grand mother's facebook she was like as a child like that would be awesome and now yeah. there's these like records of your history and your ancestry that is an interesting concept because now if you look at it that way wouldn't you always try to be a little more careful about how you conduct yourself if you knew that someone might read your records one day <laughs> maybe i don't know yeah. <laughs> i like to be, I like to be real <laughs> people yeah. tend to like I think that overall, like, you know, there's stages in development of, and there's stages of the process and everything. And just imagine if humanity was, you know, on one level, I'm sure there's many levels to it, but on one level, what if it was a potential, you know, it was like, what could this become? Well, I'm sure that the process would go in stages and to get to the end stage, like the optimal stage, people would really have to assume a stance of personal accountability and responsibility and self-governance, you know, like that would probably be a catalyst for that, for, you know, the full unfoldment of what's possible because you can't, you know, imagine if the internet and the signal there could be amplified by the ley lines, the, the grid that covers the earth, like a literally like a natural map. Like imagine if that was the case and it was like a singularity of some, some sorts and people could have this unlimited access to knowledge and, you know, um, like being able to create things and just different things like that. Like you would really have to make sure that that type of, let's call it power, because I mean, what else would you call it? It would have to, yeah, it would have to be given to people who are ready to receive it. Because imagine that in the wrong hands. So I have something to tell you guys about Gatekeeper. And this is something I learned yesterday when I was on a demo call about um, and. Uh, a software that's like an AI driven cybersecurity software that just is amazing. The potential is amazing. And they were showing me real time just so people understand, you know, passwords are the gateway to your data. And I think people are naive about the amount of attacks that happen on a daily basis. So while we were oh, yeah. on this call, this guy pulled up his screen with this automated software and looked at current attacks happening on his small business only. And there were wow. already 5,000 attempted attacks that day. 5,000. Yeah. He said that's, that's nothing. Powerful. He said some of their medical practices experience millions because these people, these hackers have, have access to automated software. So the, that using that term again, exponential growth, the, the danger is exponential just as the growth is. Well, you know, efficiency is laziness. Laziness breeds efficiency because you don't yeah. want to do that all the time. Yeah. The <laughs> I realize the, that. Yeah, moral of the story, we're not sure what the internet is, but we are sure that you should secure your password. Yeah. <laughs> and lock it down just in case. Lock you know, it down. I mean, especially what if your data is really important? Like what if your data is the representation of you and that's Im an immutable record? Like you better take your data seriously. That's a good point too. Lock it down, you know, protect it. Like it might be your actual digital identity. Very yeah, no, I mean, you're 100% correct. So we, we need a, yeah, gatekeeper, 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 right? <laughs> yes, I love gatekeeper and I use yeah. it. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, it really is a solution. That's that's the thing. We have everybody. We got all kinds of problems we can identify, but when you find a quality solution, it's definitely worth it's definitely worth um, talking about. Hundred percent agreed. I all mean, right, Jamila, we know you have a hard stop, but thanks for joining us. It was lovely to hear your story. It's sad that we interact as humans so often. Like we've talked to you, I don't know how many times, and we never heard <laughs> your backstory. So, note to self: we should try to try to do that earlier in the process of human interactions. <laughs> yeah and you're a cool Absolutely. dude so thank you so much yeah thanks jamel appreciate you 
No, thank you. I'm going to speak with you both. I mean, I'm all, like, like same with Aaron. BJ's always giving me new things to kind of Google and look up on Wikipedia to figure out a little bit more about. So, no, I, I enjoy speaking with you both. Thanks for listening to the Cybersecurity and Compliance Podcast with Craig Petronella. For other episodes and more information, visit PetronellaTech.com. Also visit our other websites, ComplianceArmor.com and BlockchainSecurity.com. Don't forget to like and subscribe. Thanks for listening and stay secure.